Hi, anatomy students, and welcome to the lymphatic system. This will be on chapter 24. Um, the lymphatic system is sometimes known as your immune system, um, even though that's not really what it, it should be called, but it does have um, things about the immune system that, that involved in it, but we'll focus on what the lymphatic system means first of all. So your lymphatic system is made up of all your lymph, the lymphatic vessels, lymphatic tissue, lymphatic nodules, lymph nodes, the thymus, the spleen, and the tonsils. And the best way I can describe your lymphatic system, it's kind of like your body's catch-all system. So any excess fluid that isn't in the blood but is in the interstitial space will be picked up by your lymphatic system, filtered, and then taken eventually back to uh, the superior vena cava in your blood. So after blood travels through all the capillary beds and is moved to the venous system, your veins, some of its fluid will always be left behind in the tissues. And this fluid and any plasma proteins and considered lymph become part of the interstitial fluid and must be returned to the cardiovascular system. They will eventually return any excess fluid in the tissues back into the venous system or your veins. So that is a really brief but a good overview of what your lymphatic system is. So here's a look at the lymphatic vessels and the lymphatic organs in the, lymph in the system. Uh, your tonsils, your cervical lymph nodes, right lymphatic duct. All the things you see in green are the lymphatic vessels which will lead eventually to lymphatic ducts and back into the venous system or the superior vena cava. So the lymphatic vessels, especially in your legs, will also have valves in them to try to keep lymph flowing up against gravity. Your spleen is part of the lymphatic system um, as, as well as what we call malt mucosa associated lymphatic tissue, your red bone marrow and auxil auxiliary lymph nodes. Lymphatic pathways start at lymphatic capillaries that will merge into larger vessels that will empty into your circulatory system. They will be similar to capillaries in that one layer is very thin of simple squamous epithelium. Lymphatic vessels will return approximately three liters of fluid back to the vascular system each day. And fluid in lymphatic vessels is known as lymph and it's made up of water, gases, nutrients, ions, wastes, and hormones. So again, um, the lymphatic system and the lymph is kind of the catch-all system for excess fluid throughout the tissues of your body, and it will eventually get that fluid uh, back to venous drainage in your veins. And again, anytime you see a green vessel, that's one of your lymphatic vessels. They'll hang out around capillaries um, to try to pick up any in excess um, fluid uh, in the surrounding tissues. Lymphatic vessels will be a one-way system flowing always towards the heart. The order of vessels are capillaries, collecting vesicles, trunks, and ducts. And the goal is to cleanse the lymph or filter it um, so that it can get back into the superior vena cava into the right atrium. Excess plasma in the tissues is called interstitial fluid, which is forced into the lymphatic capillaries where it's called lymph and then it will be filtered and cleaned and sent back into the blood system as plasma again. So here's a look at lymphatic vessels. The walls of lymphatic vessels will be thinner than veins, but they're made up of the same muscular layers and valves on the inside to help the lymph flow forward and in one direction. The lymphatic trunks form from merging lymphatic vessels each trunk will drain lymph from a specific body region. So the jugular trunks will drain lymph from your head and neck. The subclavian trunks drain lymph from the upper limbs, the breast, the superficial thoracic wall. The bronchomediastinal trunks will drain lymph from the deep thoracic structures. The intestinal trunks will drain lymph from most of your abdominal structures. And the lumbar trunks will drain lymph from your lower limbs the abdominal pelvic wall and the pelvic organs. And you can see where they drain, these trunks will eventually lead into um, the left or right um, subclavian veins, into this brachiocephalic vein, and eventually into the superior vena cava to be put back into the bloodstream. Lymphatic ducts, there are two major ducts that are formed by the union of the trunks. 
the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct. Your right lymphatic duct will drain into the right subclavian vein from the right arm and the right side of the head and thorax. And the thoracic duct is unique in that it drains into the left subclavian vein, but it drains lymph from the entire rest of the body. And this is a good diagram showing where those two ducts drain lymph from. Your lymph nodes will contain lymphocytes, which is a type of white blood cell involved in the immune response, and also macrophages that help us to destroy pathogens, which is anything foreign that enters the body. Your lymph nodes are bean shaped and they're located along the distribution of vessels, but will be larger clusters uh, found in the cervical, inguinal, and axillary regions. The main role of your lymph nodes is to filter lymph and remove bacteria and cellular debris before it enters the blood again. Um, and that is due to the role of the macrophages. Lymph nodes will also be centers of lymphocyte production that will help the body in fighting disease. So your lymph nodes, again, are P-shaped structures that help filter and clean the lymph fluid. Afferent vessels will take lymph into the node and efferent vesicles will take lymph away from the node. Mostly, again, they're located in the neck, axillary region, and groin region. And again, they help just filter pathogens in the lymph fluid, such as bacteria and viruses, before returning all the lymph fluid um, in, back into the plasma and the blood. Uh, they will contain macrophages that ingest and destroy pathogens, as well as contain lymphocytes. So here's a look at lymph flow. There's three main factors for lymph flow. The skeletal muscle pump, so the contraction of your muscles helps to kind of squeeze against those lymphatic vessels to cause the lymph to continue moving. The respiratory pump, the changes in breathing, uh, will cause pressure differences that kind of suck or help lymph flow back up against gravity, and then smooth muscle contraction in the lymph vessels themselves. The inability to move lymphatic fluid will often result in a condition known as edema, and edema is just swelling, uh, usually a buildup of fluid. Uh, it can occur in your ankles, your feet, as shown in this picture, and pitting might occur where if you kind of make a depression in the edema with your finger or hand, um, the depression will stay there for some time instead of kind of popping back to normal, and that's called pitting. The thymus is a soft organ located behind the sternum. It will shrink in size during your lifetime, so it's very large as a child and small as an adult. It's most active as a fetus and an infant, and the main function of your thymus is to secrete the hormone thymosin, which will influence the development of T cell formation. Lymphocytes that survive this maturation process are then will be used to help with immunity. So this is just um, kind of a great summary of all the lymphoid organs, their structure, their functions, and their location throughout the body. So feel free to pause this and just to read through that chart uh, to give you kind of a good summary of the lymphoid organs. The spleen is very important as a lymphoid organ. It's located in the upper left abdominal cavity. It's the largest of your body's lymphatic organs. It resembles a large lymph node in a way, except that it will contain blood instead of lymph. And its major functions are to clean the blood, remove damaged red blood cells, remove pathogens and anything else undesired by the macrophages. Your spleen is also important for the proliferation of lymphocytes, for immune surveillance and response, and it will act as a reservoir for blood as the red blood cells or platelets. Here's the structure of the spleen. It's made up of red pulp and white pulp. Um, the splenic artery and splenic vein bring the blood into the spleen and drain it into the thylum. The red pulp is the venous supply where your red blood cells, platelets, and macrophages will be. And the white blood is your arterial supply where your T cells, B cells, and macrophages will be. So body defenses against infection. Uh, Disease-causing agents, also known as pathogens, can produce infections within the body. And the body has two major lines of defense. The non-specific immunity guards against any pathogen and the specific immunity mounts a response against a very specific target. 
and this will be carried out by lymphocytes that recognize a specific invader. We also divide the body defenses into an innate def defense or an adaptive defense. Innate defenses have been with you since you were born as a fetus. Um, some of your innate defenses are surface barriers like skin and mucous membranes, and also internal defenses, phagocytes, fever, natural killer cells, antimicrobial proteins, and inflammation. And adaptive defenses are something that your body creates as an adaptation to a foreign substance. And we have humoral immunity where our B cells come in and cellular immunity, which is where our T cells will be involved with. So non-specific defenses, these are six major methods of non-specific defenses. Um, mechanical barriers like your skin and mucous membranes, chemical barriers like your tears, which have lysozyme to help clean out infections in the tears, um, fever, inflammation, phagocytosis, which is the engulfing of anything foreign by a cell, natural killer cells, um, and I think we covered them all there, reflexes and sneezing is also a nonspecific defense. Mechanical barriers, so unbroken skin and mucous membranes of the body create mechanical barriers that prevent the entry of certain pathogens. And these mechanical barriers are the body's first line of defense. As long as these are intact, uh, many pathogens cannot actually harm us. So a lot of times if we get um, some sort of infection or bacteria, it's usually because it entered um, in the form of a cut or some sort of um, destruction of one of these mechanical barriers. Chemical barriers, just as the highly acidic environment um, provided by gastric juices in the stomach, lysozyme in your tears can kill many pathogens. So it's another first line of defense. Once a foreign substance has entered our bodies, lymphocytes can produce something called interferons. And these are hormone-like structures that will serve as antiviral substances or tumor cells. And they will induce nearby cells to produce an antiviral enzyme that protects them from infection. They try to block the replication of the disease. So these are chemical barriers. Fever offers powerful protection against infection by interfering with the proper conditions that promote bacterial growth. So persistent presence of a viral or bacterial pathogen stimulates your lymphocytes to secrete what we call interleukin-1, which is known as the fire maker. And during fever, the amount of iron in the blood will be reduced by way of the liver and spleen, and thus fewer nutrients are available to support the growth of the pathogens. Phagocytic cells also will attack, um, will also attack with a greater vigor when the temperature rises. And fever is an example of the second line of defense. Inflammation is a tissue response to a pathogen. Um, so it's an, an immune response designed to remove damaged tissue and foreign <laughs> substances. We can have acute or chronic inflammation. Acute is caused by minor injuries and chronic uh, it is usually a sustained inflammation due to diet or an autoimmune disorder. It's characterized by redness, swelling, heat, and pain. It's one of your body's second line of defense. Major actions during inflammation are dilation of blood vessels, increasing blood flow to an area, um, swelling, invasion of white blood cells that help to control the pathogens. Pus is a re resulting mass of white blood cells, bacterial cells, and damaged tissue. An exudate is a collection of tissue fluids that will be aimed at walling off the area of infection to help inhibit the spread of disease to any adjacent tissue. So that is inflammation. Phagocytosis is then the removal of foreign particles from the lymph as it moves through the interstitial space to the bloodstream. They, these are cells that are floating in the blood <laughs> waiting to fight disease. They're located in your blood, liver, spleen, and bone marrow, and they'll be activated when the body detects damaged tissues. There are two major types of cells mostly responsible for phagocytosis. Neutrophils engulf and digest smaller particles, and monocytes will engulf larger particles. Natural killer cells then will destroy virus-infected cells and some tumor cells in the body tissue. Specific defenses are the body's third line of defense, and this refers to the response mounted by the body against specific recognized foreign molecules. 
and such molecules that can elicit an immune response are called antigens. Antigens, so before birth, your body has the ability to recognize molecules that are made by the body called self, and the immune system will always react to non-self molecules and reacts to fight them. Antigens will be usually larger molecules that will elicit this immune response. <coughs> lymphocyte origin. So during fetal development, your red bone marrow will, re will release lymphocytes into circulation. 70-80% will become T lymphocytes, which are T cells, and the rest will become B lymphocytes or B cells. Both B and T cells reside in your lymphatic organs. T cells will mature in the thymus and B cells will mature in the red bone marrow. So here's a look at T, the types of T lymphocytes and their functions. Um, through mitosis, you create, create more helper T lymphocytes and these helper T lymphocytes can stimulate B lymphocyte production to produce antibodies. So B lymphocytes will produce antibodies. Um, regulation of cytotoxic T lymphocyte activity or the formation of more macrophages. So these are the three kind of destinations that a helper T cell T lymphocyte can become. A B lymphocyte that will produce antibodies, um, a cytotoxic T cell or the formation of more <laughs> macrophages. B lymphocytes and their role in the immune response um, helper T lymphocytes, as we just saw, will secrete cytokines and present an antigen to the B lymphocyte. The B lymphocyte will then undergo mitosis and differentiate into plasma cells and memory B cells. Short-lived plasma cells will secrete antibodies and memory B cells will remain to protect against future attacks. If the same antigen enters the body at a later time, your memory B cells will undergo mitosis to make more plasma cells and memory cells. <laughs> so here's a look at the types of T lymphocytes and their functions. We can get a cytotoxic T cell um, eventually contacting an infected cell. The cytotoxic T lymphocyte will detach and the infected cell will die. So this is a great kind of summary chart of all the types of T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, and natural killer cells that you should spend some time learning. So you can pause the slide here um, to just kind of review the different types of T lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, and the natural killer cell. Lymphocyte function. So your B and T cells will both react different, differently to pathogens they recognize. T cells will attach to foreign antigen bearing cells such as bacteria, by a direct cell-to-cell -cell contact called the cell-mediated immunity. And B cells will attack pathogens by differentiating into plasma cells that ultimately secrete antibodies. So this is known as the humoral immune response. T cells in the cellular-mediated response. Common T cells are our cytotoxic, uh, which will destroy the pathogen's DNA and cause lysis or splitting of the cell. Helper T cells will stimulate T cell and B cell division to recruit more help. And memory T cells will recognize a foreign antigen and are stimulated when faced with that same antigen again and will convert to cytotoxic T cells to help fight the pathogen. Phagocytosis um, is the idea of engulfing some sort of anything foreign and then digesting it and then spitting it out. <laughs> Macrophages derived from monocytes will ingest a foreign pathogen. They'll destroy it. They might leave antigen fragments on their plasma membrane, and this will stimulate the activation of more T cells for further destruction. B cells in the humoral immune response. So as we said before, B cells will secrete special proteins called antibodies, and antibodies will travel through the blood and lymph to the location of the pathogen site. There are millions of different B cells, each able to respond to one specific antigen and produce one specific antibody. Immature B cells are made in the bone marrow and then released into the blood, and mature B cells are found in the blood, lymph, lymph organs, and spleen. There are five major types of antibodies. They're called immunoglobulins, and we have G, A, M, D, E, 
and they're found in different parts. So IgG is found in tissue fluid and plasma. Um, IgA is found in exocrine gland secretions like breast milk, saliva, and tears. IgM is found in plasma to react with blood cell transfusion. IgD is found on the surface of most B lymphocytes. And IgE is found in exocrine secretions to promote allergic reactions. And that's the end of this chapter. Thanks for listening, guys.